Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Chelly Phillips, who is in Georgia. How are you doing, Chelly? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me today. Oh, absolutely. And Shelley is a speaker, a writer, um, uh, and uh, also produces courses. And uh, what we're going to talk about today is creating a culture of engaged employees uh, and how the power of building your personal brand can have on the success journey. But uh, so um, let's 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 get straight into it. OK, um, Shelley. Um, one of the things I think it's been a massive challenge, obviously, over the last couple, well, there's, there's a bunch of challenges, right? We've had the COVID challenge, and that is people virtual, getting them engaged, et cetera. We have, uh, and somebody told me that we have four, if not five generations in the workplace for the first time ever. So again, not everybody, you know, there's different ways that people like to engage. Um, so it, it, it's quite the, it's quite the challenge. It is. It is. It is very much a challenge these days. Uh, you know, you were talking earlier about the generations in the workplace and each one of them loves to be communicated in a different way. And they all have their own wants and their needs. And, you know, it can it can be very tricky for a supervisor, a manager and even, you know, your, your organization leadership to determine which way do I want to go? How do I make sure I'm including everybody and making them feel that they're part of this organization and have a voice and are valued? No, I, I, absolutely, and uh, and and I think that really came came to the fore during obviously the the pandemic because I think uh, companies that understood this understood the need for over communication probably, but also the need to communicate in multiple different ways for multiple different audiences fared well. I think the ones who just communicate in one, you know, they have one mode or format of communication probably didn't. Yeah, you know, I, it, it's it's amazing, really, when you start looking at the statistics, you know, an engaged workforce can make all the difference in the success that your company's having. And it can even, you know, set you up to outperform your competition or it can help you, you set you up to fail, depending on which way, you know, which side you fall out on it. And it really is about investing in the people in the organization and providing them the opportunities that they need to develop as leaders. And part of that is communication. That's a huge part of any career development. And it's also a huge part in making sure that your workforce is getting the right messages, making sure that there's that upstream downstream with them so that they have a way to communicate back with you so that you're all hearing and seeing if the messages are being received the way that you're intended to put them out. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it does take that it does take a, a you have to look at the feedback loop in order to see whether it's uh, it's having an impact or not. So as we move forward, Shelley, what are some of the ways that you can, you know, if a company really wants to unlock the power of their employees, get them engaged, get them like brand ambassadors and all of that? What, what are some of the steps to take? So the very first thing I think that you all have to be on the same page, you know, I, your employees have to feel like they are part of that success journey and that they're contributing to the success that the organization is having. You know, it, it really is about getting that that communication going and getting that feedback. Um, I did a, a, a training not too long ago for an organization, and one of the keys to it is connecting them with your mission and your vision. And I, I always ask when I do these things, you know, if you weren't having to depend on your paycheck, what would you be doing right now? And about two thirds of this group was it was something philanthropic, whether it was, you know, working with, you know, someone that was hungry and needed to be fed, whether it was animal rescue, whether it was elderly care, whatever it was, it was something philanthropic. And so, you know, that was something that was able to take back to the corporate table and be like, you need to empower these people to feel like they're having a, that they're making a difference in your customers' lives. And so when you can connect your mission and value for the organization with the mission and values that your employees care about, then they're going to, they're going to be more productive. They're going to be happier. They're going to have higher job satisfaction. And of course, that's going to help you with retention. And it's also going to help you with retention with hiring because that is where they become the brand ambassador for you. You know, because we all know that if you have that bad day at work or you have a boss that you just can't stand, everybody goes to social media and they blow it up. 
And so the flip side is also true. If your employees are out there talking about how you're investing in them, how that you're helping them reach their career aspirations, how that they feel that they have a part of the success journey and how that they're maybe able to meet these values that they have inside with while doing their job, they become this ambassador for you and it makes it so much easier to hire as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think the obviously part of that is, as you said, is everybody understanding the mission and the vision of the company. So they have to be real because let's face it, a lot of companies, it's it's not worth the paper it's written on, to be perfectly honest. It's just a bump. It's something that they do it, you know, every so often, but it's never communicated properly to to people in the organization and it's and it's never demonstrated how they can impact or support this. Yeah, I say the problems really begin in the workplace when people don't have clear direction from their leaders or that their mission statement is just, you know, a, a dusty piece of paper that's hanging on the wall somewhere. They really have to, you know, become engaged with that and turn it around and make it part of your culture, you know even if it means kind of rewriting that and putting some of the, the the words and phrases that resonate with your employees in there so that they can see themselves in that vision. You know, it, it's not about um, having fake authenticity. You know, that's the worst thing possible out there because your employees will know whether your mission and your values are really true. And, you know, like if you have all these nice words up on the wall and they're not seeing those in their team meetings or they're not seeing those when they're having their evaluations or they're not seeing those in how you're treating your customers and doing those kind of things, then then it's then it's really a failure from the top down. Yeah, no, I'm 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 uh, absolutely in in agreement, and I'm 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 glad you mentioned that because, um, yeah, it's it, it, it's such a it's such a tough one uh, sometimes because people you know organizations at leadership level you know sometimes just don't understand how disconnected people can become, and the thing is at the end of the day is yeah you don't want a dusty mission statement sitting on someone's desk but you do want to you do want something I, I used to I did this at one. A couple of companies I ran some years ago is I produced a one page laminated. This is our strategy for the years, our mission, this is what we're going to do. And I gave it to everybody in the company and I said, put that in your workspace. And if you're doing anything during the year and you can't relate it back to this, then I want you to go to your manager and ask them, why am I doing this? Uh, that that is that is such a good thing. It's like you know when they feel like they have that open line of communication, it makes things so much different. It's all about cultivating that culture where you know to turn for the disengaged back to the engaged, and you know it, it's real funny when you start working with companies and doing this kind of thing. Is you know I tell my my clients that you know over half of the people who leave a job it's, say they left because no one ever talked to them about their future there. So, you know, right. when you're doing the evaluations and you're doing, you know, appraisals and that kind of thing, it's really important that you talk about how you see them as part of the future of that organization. You know, if you're going to invest in them and teach them how to do that position, if you're going to provide the software, if you're going to provide the training, if you're going to, you know, have the benefits and everything else, you know, it is very important that they actually see that they have that path to success and that what they're doing really does impact the organization in a positive way. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And I have this I have this real issue with performance appraisals, to be honest, is that in most organizations, uh, certainly in my experience, the performance appraisal yeah, it comes around once a year. And what happens is, you know, Chelly, you come in and I say, oh, yeah, Chelly, here, uh, yeah, you did, uh, yeah, la last year you did this really well and you did that really well. Now here's 55 things that you didn't do so well. And now we're going to just focus all on that. And this, this crazy idea of, as you said, investing in people, we invest in trying to make them good at things that they're not good at. And we don't invest in, in saying, here's the things that you really excel in. And I'm going to figure out how to maximize that. Oh, I totally agree. I love it when you can focus on strengths. You know, I tell a lot of my clients, you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of like strength finders, Clifton strengths that Gallup puts out there and that kind of thing so that you can really work inside your organization and, and find out what areas people really excel at. Because you know as well as I do that 
you know, your strengths are always going to be your strengths. Your and and the more you work on them, the better that they're going to get. Your weaknesses, you'll be able to improve them, but they're mm-hmm. never going to top what your actual strengths are. And when you can get your team working and and they learn how to utilize those strengths and they learn how to use them as part of a team, and then they learn, you know, the downsides of those, like how people may perceive them in certain situations. You know, like how to temper those, how to become effective as team leaders, how to become effective as supervisors. Then then it really does does change the culture inside of an organization because you become more of that coach. And when you have a coach, you have someone that you feel like is on your side, pushing you to be better, not someone who's looking for a way that you're going to fail. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And if you look at, um, if you look at the coaches of, of, of sports teams or, you know, I follow, I follow soccer or real football, but that's another story. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but back, I mean, is, is if you have somebody who's really good going forward, you don't spend your whole time saying, well, listen, I'm going to turn you into a defender, right? You say, I'm going to figure out how to let you like have free reign to be able to you know do what you're really good at. But that's not the way a lot of organizations run. As I said, they just focus on the other side. And here's another challenge, Shelley, is that um, the tenure of people now, I mean, it, they're saying now like millennials are only staying, you know, 15 months in jobs, you know, they're switching jobs a lot. I think, you know, there's the great resignation. There's a lot of people going, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to go out on my own. So I, I think the future of organizations and engagement is going to be quite complex because you're going to have full time employees. Uh, and maybe you, maybe they're in an office. Maybe you have some that are remote. Maybe sometimes they're in the office and sometimes they're remote. And then maybe you have a bunch of like external contractors or things. So you have you go, and maybe they're spread across the globe. So you're going to have this mixture of people. And then trying to keep them all engaged and on brand and all of that is going to be a massive challenge. It is, and it's 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 not going to be a one size fits all anymore. It's not going to be about having the one big employee meeting a year where you know everybody gets the pat on the back and they get the logo to apparel or they get you know some item to take mm-hmm. home. It really is going to be about each supervisor, each team, each group, you know, working together and making those making that effort to stay in contact. If you know if they have half remote, half in the office, you know, you're going to have to adjust how you as that leader are communicating and putting that out there. It's also your responsibility to be the one to create that engagement. And, you know, you really need to start looking for those signs where things are falling off. You know, if you have a star performer and then they start just doing the minimum to get by or you have meetings, you know, whether they're Zoom or whether they're in person or, or Teams or whatever the popular platform ends up being a couple of years from now, mm-hmm. that, you know, no one is communicating and sharing ideas. Or if people start missing deadlines or if absenteeism becomes a problem, it's really important that you start putting your finger on these these little these little tails sooner rather than later so that you can start adjusting and find out. And, you know, the thing I find is really funny is is most of most of your supervisors and most of your leaders don't ask their teams, how can I engage with you? And it's a simple question that can really solve a lot of problems. You know, maybe they would rather have a text. Maybe they would rather have an email, you know. And it really is about trying to create the best platform that's possible to get as many people involved and making them feel like they have a voice and a say in what's happening. Yeah, no, that's that's a great, great point. I'd just like to underline that. Yeah, I mean, I think they don't, most people don't ask how would you like to be communicated with? And and people have lots of different preferences nowadays. I keep telling this story. I was, I was talking to somebody who's a sales trainer and he was doing a ride along with a salesperson recently. And uh, one of the prospects or customers or whatever um, texted the salesperson the sales per- while they were in the car and the salesperson immediately picked up the phone called them and uh, you know had a kind of awkward conversation and then hung up and the coach turned around and said oh that was interesting so the 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 the, the prospect texted you and he said yeah and yeah he said so why did you call him why did you not just text him back and ask him you know here's i could explain this over text or maybe it'd be better if we got on a call he he reached out to you in text wanted to be text back but you decided to call him so you didn't match with his preferred way of communicating yeah, and you know that's especially important. The, it, the younger the generation is, you know, it, and it's real. You assume that your millennials and 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 your Gen Zs and stuff like that are going to be the ones. Oh, they only want digital communications. But what you're actually seeing mm-hmm. in the workplace is they've had so much of that 
that they really do enjoy the face to face sometimes or they enjoy, you know, being able to be in a group setting on team of faces and everything instead of just communicating digitally. And then you have, you know, your boomers and different things like that that are in the organization that really do like that piece of paper in front of them so that they've got something to refer back to or either they want that. I want you to tell me specifically what it is that you want. And it really is about you knowing your audience, whether that's your customers or whether that's your employees and, and giving them the information the way that they want to receive it. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. And, and then how do you deal with the, as I said, is the fact that, you know, there's there's probably more movement in and out of companies now than there has been f for a long time. And as things kind of, um, you know, get back to some more settle down a little, that will probably increase, not decrease. It is. But, you know, even if you have people moving out, you're going to have people moving in. And it's it's interesting when you look at the numbers, they say that if you have to rehire and retrain someone, you're looking at about a six month investment in salary that before they actually start getting any return from them, because it's going to by the time you've spent your advertising, by the spent your training and onboarding and getting them up to speed and getting them to be a productive person, that it's cost the company about six months of their salary. So if you mm. can cut that time off and make them a more productive, more profitable employee sooner rather than later, you know, it's a big boost. And the best way to do that is to not have them leave at all. And the way we're seeing that is, is, is that you basically become their success partner. You have to help show them the professional path that they have with you, that there is movement, that there are ways for them to increase their leadership, increase their visibility, you know, be involved in training making them feel part of that organization so that they don't leave. And, you know, it, it's not as cut and dry as, you know, all the millennials will be gone in two years and then we'll have a new batch that's coming in. You know, it really does behoove a company or an organization to start early on when you get that person in the door, start working them and start showing them that they have that path to success and, you know, start working with them, you know, it, it, when I when I work with personal branding on my clients that, you know, I, I tell them whether they're actively creating that brand or not, they have one. And whether we're talking mm -hmm. about a digital or online presence or whether we're talking about a reputation, which is basically your brand as well. It's like those first things that you do on your job. How do you make yourself known? How are you communicating with people? What are you doing to learn the organization? What are you doing to become the best person in that position that you can be so that people begin to recognize and see you so that you can move and do that kind of thing and, and that you don't get, uh, you know, burnt out in the position that you're in and that you're, you're learning from these challenges that come before you. And the majority of people say that they like to be challenged. They like to learn new things because they get tired of doing the same thing day and out. And so I know some positions are kind of repetitive, you know, an accounting position is going to be, you know, I'm making sure things balance, I'm cutting the checks, I'm getting them out. You have a set, you know, list of things that you're going to have to do, but that doesn't mean that they can't learn about another part of the organization. You know, do they know how the process is? Like what happens all before that invoice gets in there for them to pay? How many mm -hmm. people touch this? How many work orders are involved before they get there? And when people can see that their jobs connect and that it impacts others inside the organization, they're more apt to take pride in it. They're more apt to do a, a better job with it. It's more, it's less mistakes in what they're doing. And, and it really helps build that culture of, of being a team instead of me being the individual here that is just doing this task over and over again. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I think also when you start to make those connections, then maybe the person in accounting suddenly goes, oh, I could probably help them. That's not that deficient. I could probably help them with that. And then you've got, and then you've got, wow, so the accountancy is working with this or yeah, it, it, it fosters a greater sense of, of teamwork. I think the other thing, Shelley, too, is I think organizations, if you're, if the type of work you do lends itself to this, I think being more flexible, as I said, with people either working from home or, you know, hybrid of work at home from the office, even even going to live in different countries, if it allows that. I mean, we had somebody who during the pandemic in our in our Slovakia, um, who worked in our Slovakia office, um, the lockdowns were so bad at that one stage there that she asked, I'm, I'm going to take my kids to Thailand for two months. Is that okay? And I'll work from there. And the nature of the work she's doing as a project manager, she was able to do it 
internet was fine. We were like, yeah, of course. I mean, that's fine. She's a long-term employee. We've done loser. And if this makes her happy and her kids happier, then so be it. I mean, I think that's the thing that they, the pandemic has really taught us is that we do have to be adaptable and flexible. And, you know, there's going to be another situation that comes through after this, whether it's, okay. it's health related or whether it's financial or whether it's, you know, some kind of crisis, you know, a, you know, a utility, a storm, hurricane, anything like that. You know, it, it's one of those things is that you just have to learn to adapt to what comes out there. It's the rigidity that keeps you from growing and it keeps people from wanting to do things because they feel like there is no room for movement and there is no one listening to how can we make these processes and things better and work for the situation situations that we're in now. And so it really, it really does, you know, that, that adaptability and flexibility, I think are going to be things that we see that stay from the pandemic, that we're going to see, you know, hiring packages are going to change to reflect, you know, how our people want to work, how do we get them mm -hmm. there? And, you know, it's going to be something that the organizations that embrace that and that they begin to put them into place sooner are going to be the ones that are more successful. And that's where people want to go and work. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And I think the other bit of advice for organizations is as you work through this is don't look at it from a, oh, Shelly wants to work remotely. Great. Now let's figure all the things we can take away from her and save ourselves. You know, that's a really bad starting point. And that's where a lot of companies, unfortunately, have gone immediately. Um, listen, Shelly, this is this has been fantastic. All of Shelly's information will be below the video. Uh, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Uh, yeah, so I am a career strategist and I am a corporate trainer. I work with companies on building a culture of engaged employees. And I do that with, you know, helping them increase their employees' brands so that they become brand ambassadors out in the community for them as well. And I work with individuals who want to make career changes or career moves and help them get more visibility in the workplace. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Shelly is the author of three books, One Habit for Women Action Takers. Get noticed, get hired, and my favorite one, when in doubt, delete it. I love that. That's a great piece of advice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we all only, need to stop if and only. Do that sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, exactly. I think they should re reconfigure keyboards and the delete key should be like half the size of the keyboard and then the rest of the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't need to be hidden up at the top. Yes. <laughs> it does, exactly. Exactly. Take a deep breath and hit, hit delete. <laughs> Listen, Shelly, this is fantastic. Thank you so much for today. Uh, thank you for watching and listening. And I will see you all again really soon. Thank you.